Hi, everyone. Thanks to those of you who have joined us already. We are just going to wait until four o'clock on the dot to get started. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. We've got a lot of people joining. We started a whole minute early, so we're just giving it a, a minute or so for people to trickle in. Wow, this is fantastic. We have almost a thousand people joining us today on the Zoom call alone. Thank you again to everyone who has joined us and welcome. My name is Sharon and I'm the communications manager and, and you can call me the virtual host of this webinar series. Uh, we are so glad to be here with you today and of course we hope that everyone and your loved ones are staying safe. Um, April, you know, is such a fun time for all of us at Audubon. Birds are migrating back to the Northeast, the first hummingbirds are being spotted and one of the one of the questions that we get nonstop right around this time is, uh, not surprisingly, how can I support birds and pollinators right now? So we today have Emily May from the Xerces Society to help us answer that question. Emily will be talking about the importance of pollinators for ecosystems and our daily lives the habitat needs of pollinators, and how native plants support birds and bees, and how to turn our yards and gardens into a pollinator refuge. As always, this webinar will be recorded and posted to our Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York YouTube pages, to our websites, and uh, even to Facebook because we are also live streaming today. Questions are welcome at any time, and in fact, a few of our Audubon experts will join Emily after her presentation to help answer them. And with that, I will pass the microphone over to Emily May of the Xerces Society. Great, thanks for having me. Um, hi everybody, thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, I did want to draw your attention to the link at the top of the Zoom broadcast, which starts with translate.it. Um, and I think someone will post that in the chat, but that is a link to live closed captioning for this webinar uh, for those who might want it. So if you follow the link in your internet browser, put in your name and click join the conversation, you'll see real time captioning for the webinar. Um, I'm sure they won't be perfect. According to the captions, I think I'm giving this presentation to a highway in Germany and not the Audubon Society. So I apologize for that and also that they're not integrated directly here. Um, but we will have closed captioning available on the recording once it goes up on YouTube. So with that, I think I am gonna turn off my video. I just wanted to give you a hello from my actual self, um, but I find it distracting. So I'm gonna turn off my video. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thanks to Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York for organizing this webinar and inviting me to speak. My name is Emily May. I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the pesticide program at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And I'll be speaking you, to you today about native plants and pollinators. So we'll cover the importance of pollinators for ecosystems and our diets. We'll talk, talk about some of the main groups of animals that pollinate and then how we can support those pollinators with native plants and by building wildlife habitat into our yards and gardens. So some of the specific plants I'll be talking about are most relevant for the Northeast, but general concepts here should be relevant anywhere you might be listening in from. So looking forward to answering some of your questions at the end. So 
I know a lot of times acknowledgments go at the end of a presentation, but I did want to put this up front to give a special thanks to the Xerces Society members and our other supporters that make our work possible and allow us to continue doing on the ground conservation work and educational presentations like this one. If you haven't heard of Xerces, we've been around since 1971. We work to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. Our name is a reference to the Xerces blue butterfly pictured here, which is believed to be the first American butterfly that went extinct due to human development. Uh, it lived in the coastal sand, sand dunes around San Francisco. We do a variety of on the ground conservation work. We have programs in pollinators and ag biodiversity, endangered species, pesticides, and we have a new community engagement program focused on urban communities. Our main office is in Portland, Oregon, but we have staff across the country working on pollinator habitat restoration, conservation planning, and providing technical assistance in ag, natural and urban areas. This photo is a picture of Kelly, my colleague in New Jersey in her happy place. She works as a partner biologist with the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, helping farmers and land managers in the Northeast create habitat for pollinators. So two of our other programs are more recent. Um, we have a certification program, Be Better Certified for Farmers that adopt land management practices to support pollinators, allowing them to label their products Be Better. We've also become the home for the Bee City and Bee Campus USA programs, which support towns and cities and colleges that want to protect pollinators by providing habitat and reducing exposure to pesticides. So perhaps the most helpful work we do uh, is writing detailed science-based guides for protecting pollinators and other invertebrates. And I'll mention this again at the end, but if you take a, a trip to our website, xerces.org, we have a ton of resources on plants, pollinators, other invertebrates. This is a library that goes back decades in terms of the work we've done on protecting the little things that run the world. Speaking of which, <laughs> when I say we can serve invertebrates, what am I talking about? What does that mean? An invertebrate is any animal lacking a backbone, which includes many classes of animals from insects to crustaceans. And I know it's a little strange to talk about invertebrates in a webinar series on birds, which are vertebrates, but bear with me. Um, invertebrates account for over 95% of animal biodiversity on the planet and they play crucial roles for our survival, including by helping to break down organic matter, keeping pest populations in check, serving as food and as the base of the food chain, and then pollinating crops and wildflowers. Insects are invertebrates that have three body parts. So they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and they have six legs. The vast majority of our research and funding on insects, especially in urban areas, has focused on pest control and epidemiology, but only a tiny fraction of insect species are actually pests, less than 2%. So that's pretty disproportionate to all these other services that these insects and other invertebrates are providing. So working to sustain the abundance, diversity, and biomass of insects is essential for sustaining healthy ecosystems. And I'm here to talk to you about really just one of those major ecosystem functions, which is pollination. So pollination, the process um, is moving pollen from the male part of a flower to the female part of a flower to set seeds and nuts and fruits. More than 85% of flowering plants require an animal. So that's mostly insects, but other animals also pollinate to move that pollen. And a diverse pollinator community is really essential for sustaining both our natural areas and the, the wild plant communities that live there, as well as productive agricultural and cropland. Pollinators are incredibly important for natural systems. They allow wild flowering plants to reproduce and continue reseeding in their environments. The seeds and fruits those flowering plants uh, produce are also food sources for many other types of wildlife, from birds to mammals. Through the simple act of moving pollen from flower to flower, pollinators help build out that base of the food chain for many species. So they're also part of that base themselves. About nine in 10 bird species eat insects at some point in their life. Um, caterpillars, which are larval butterflies and moths, 
are also an incredibly important food source for many birds, especially in feeding their young. And some birds will also occasionally eat bees, either in their larval or adult form. But bees do come with the stinger, which is a little bit harder to get at than, than big juicy caterpillars. Insects are really a tremendous source of protein for a lot of wildlife. Pound for pound, insects contain more than twice as much protein as beef or fish. So pollinated foods are also super important for our diets and our lives. This photo is from a small project that Xerces did with Whole Foods. And this is what a typical produce section would look like with all the, the pollinated uh, foods that we enjoy. I'm actually looking at it now, kind of impressed with the social distancing I see in this picture, even though this picture was taken a few years ago. But here it is, you know, what, what it might be typically. And here's what it looks like without pollinated foods. Over half of the items in the produce section were taken off the shelves. So lots of the color on our plates comes from pollinated foods and a lot of the nutrients as well. Importantly for me on a personal level, pollinators are critical to two parts of my diet, coffee and chocolate. In terms of fun facts that I might give you today, chocolate is unusual. It's actually pollinated by a fly, the cacao midge. This is the cacao flower, which is an intricate flower with nectaries that are difficult to access for larger insects like bees, but it's perfectly sized for this tiny little midge. So thank you, Cacao Midge, for what you bring to my life, especially with all the cookies and brownies I've been making in quarantine. But who's responsible in general for pollination, for this really essential service that we depend on? Plants require a diversity of pollinators for effective and sustainable pollination, and lots of different types of animals actually do move pollen from one part of a flower to another. Usually, uh, these, these insects and animals are, are visiting for nectar. So we have butterflies, flies, um, wasps, beetles, birds. A lot of times they're coming to flowers for this nectary sugar source. And then they end up pollinating those plants often by chance. But bees, bees and insect are our chief and most efficient pollinators. There are many, many species of bees in uh, and around us. There are nearly 3,600 species of native bees in the United States. Um, so about 350 here in Connecticut and about 10 times that across the rest of the country. They range in size from really big carpenter bees that get into your sheds to tiny bees about the size of a freckle. And many of them don't look like what you might picture when you think of a bee, like that metallic green sweat bee in the bottom center right. So why are bees such important pollinators? In part, it's because unlike most of the animals on that last slide, bees are actively going out and collecting and transporting pollen back to their nests to feed their larvae. So they have all kinds of specialized body features for collecting pollen and they're very efficient at it. So if you look at the bee on the top right, that's a small sweat bee that has pollen packed in under the top of her hind legs. The bee underneath her on the bottom left is a leaf cutter bee, which is called a leaf cutter bee because it lines and creates walls inside of its nest uh, with little cut out leaf sections. So leaf cutter and mason bees collect their pollen underneath their abdomen. If you squint, you might be able to see the orange pollen that's coating the hairs under the abdomen on that bottom left bee. And these bees are truly excellent pollinators of plants that have those nice open flowers like the flower in that picture or apples where they can basically just belly flop onto the flower and then bustle around getting their hairs nice and loaded with pollen and then moving that pollen from plant to plant. Another reason bees are our chief pollinators is their flower handling efficiency. So when male bees are kind of like time wasters, they sit around on flowers, they sip nectar, they wait for an opportunity to mate, but female bees are really go-getters. They don't wanna waste time. So for many bees, once they've learned how to extract pollen from a particular kind of flower very efficiently, they'll keep going back to that same kind of flower instead of trying to learn how to go get pollen from something other, uh, some other kind of flower. This behavior, which is helpful for an individual female trying to get as much uh, pollen as possible for her larvae, is also great for pollination because she's bringing back that same type of pollen to every plant she visits. So actually pollinating them instead of bringing in pollen from lots of different species of flower, which isn't helpful for the plants. 
So I could go on and on about bees and their ecology, but I will try and keep it relatively to the point. When I first showed my slides to the folks at Audubon, they said, I didn't have enough of the B word in my presentation. And I was like, what do you mean? My entire presentation is bees. And they said, yes, that's the problem. Our B word is birds. So I will try and get back on track shortly. But I first did wanna quickly talk, I probably have two more slides on bees um, because I wanted to quickly talk about some of the, the things that I often hear about. So honeybees are probably the first bee that pops into people's heads when bees fly into a conversation. But the European honeybee is a single species brought to America by ship with European colonists. And it's a single species that's pretty unique. It's a social bee with a caste system. So it has a queen that lays eggs and then there are different sort of responsibilities within the hive. Um, there are workers, there's nurse bees, foragers, drones, and cooperative care of young. So that's an unusual situation for bees. Most bee species are solitary, meaning it's just a single female taking care of all of those different responsibilities. Uh, honeybees are also perennial with multiple generations a year. So they, they end up living through the winter by feeding on their honey stores, and then they can persist for several years uh, with that queen, ideally. Most bees actually have a very short time life in comparison. They're only flying for a couple of weeks, typically, um, and they, they complete their entire life cycle within just a few weeks on an annual basis. So honeybees are very unusual. They're also, you know, we've, we've lived with honeybees for thousands of years and we, they're sort of domesticated livestock. Their colonies are managed for crop pollination and moved into fields and then moved back out of fields after pollination is done. So they're, they're quite unusual. Most bees are just free living and not unmanaged. They're quite inconspicuous. So most of the 3,600 species that live in the United States actually live below ground. So about two thirds of native bees live underground. And the only thing that tells you they're there is a tiny little hole at the surface of the soil that you probably don't even see. The other third lives uh, above ground in tunnels and old snags and in pithy plant stems. So on the right is a serotina bee, which is a small carpenter bee in a blueberry cane. The last little uh, group of native bees, the bumblebees, which only make up about 1% of bee species, form small colonies in hollow cavities, which could be above or below ground, but commonly they're nesting in old rodent holes. So why do we need to talk about conservation of these pollinating species? So we don't always have the best monitoring data to say, this species is in decline, or that species is in decline. But there's a good amount of evidence suggesting that on the whole, we are seeing declines in abundance for our pollinating species, due to many of the same stress factors that threaten all kinds of other wildlife. So some of the key risk factors for all of our favorite bees, that is bees and beneficial insects and birds, fall into the same major buckets. So habitat loss, pesticide use, diseases and competition from non-native species, and climate change. These are some of the four sort of major buckets that we look at for stress factors. So in terms of habitat loss, that's uh, you know, conversion of open space with flowering plants into urban or agricultural development. You know, we think of agricultural expansion as something that happened in the past, but actually land conversion for agricultural and urban development continues to expand rapidly. Between 2008 and 2012, over 7 million acres of uncultivated land were converted to cropland, which is an area that's twice the size of Connecticut. So this is something that is a modern process and not just something that happened in the past. Habitat loss also means degradation and fragmentation of existing habitat. So the loss of plant diversity and plant quality across landscapes and the chopping up of that remnant natural land into small patches that might be inaccessible for wildlife. Uh, pesticides are a risk factor that I think a lot about as I'm on the pesticide program at Xerces, but mosquito control, home and garden uses, agricultural uses, all of those can pose risks to bees and other beneficial insects and then cascade through food systems. <clears throat> 
diseases and non-native species, I can't go into too much detail here, but thinking about insects, commercial and captive rearing is largely unregulated. So things like butterfly rearing, as well as uh, alternative managed bees, like these bumblebees here. So moving those commercial bees, moving butterflies around could mean potentially moving diseases around and increasing disease burden in wild communities. Uh, honeybees are also a potential competition source, especially in natural areas with limited food for other uh, bee species. And I can take more questions about that at the end if you're interested. And then climate change is kind of a big mystery box as far as how it's influencing species, but we do expect to see you know, shifts in plant phenology and shifts in bee emergence timing. So thinking about how um, things like weather events that happen in early spring where you get a two week warm up and then an immediate freeze and you've lost your blossoms. How might that affect bees that have already emerged or birds that have already emerged and are trying to feed at that time of year? How can we build resilience into these systems as we adapt to a new reality? The good news is there are steps we can take to address all of these threats. I think in this presentation, I'm really thinking about the first one, habitat loss, where the solution is to conserve existing habitat and create new patches of habitat. And then the last one, climate change. So planning for species resilience, planning for habitat and plant diversity. Um, and I would hope that we are also addressing pesticides at the same time, making sure that anything we create is protected from pesticides and that we're not bringing in um, diseases and non-native species. All right, so let's talk about some of the concepts. When we talk about habitat for pollinators, what do we mean? We're basically talking about providing with them with their basic needs. So food, shelter, and protection. For, for most pollinators, that's nectar, pollen, and host plants for food. Shelter means nest sites and overwintering sites. And then protection and refuge means protecting them from pesticide exposure, pesticide risk, and disturbance. A lot of times what I get asked is, well, what should I plant? And that is a great question. So what we look at for plant selection is high value native perennial plants. So plants that provide high quality nectar or pollen sources that bloom uh, throughout the growing season. So having a diversity of plants that are blooming at any given time through the growing season, um, you have sort of these overlapping flight periods for a lot of these different pollinators. So you wanna make sure there's something for everyone at any time during the season. Incorporating host plants and nesting plants. So plants that have that pithy stem that above ground nesting bees can nest in and host plants that larval butterflies and moths can feed on. Um, for all of these, picking a plant that's the right plant for the right place is really critical. So you want things that are gonna be locally adapted and able to deal with drought or able to deal with your local soil type um, and conditions. So that's why we are often, often thinking about native plants. They're the ones that are most resilient to some of the conditions that you're experiencing locally. In any case, I want um, all of us to be thinking about how we can source plants that are protected from pesticides, so that were uh, propagated in a way that um, allows for sort of clean plant materials going into the landscape. So talk to your local nursery, find your local plant, native plant nursery, um, and see if you can find out about some of their management practices and make sure that plants that you're putting in your yard are plants that you can feel good about. Plants like uh, staghorn sumac, viburnums, serviceberry, and many others, I'll talk about more, provide flowers that support bees, and the pollination that those bees provide turns into fruits and berries that support birds. So what I'm wanting to emphasize here is that providing native plants that are habitat for insect pollinators like bees or butterflies is an umbrella action that supports many other kinds of wildlife and creates resilient plant and animal communities. Doug Tallamy, University of Delaware professor that I'm sure many of you have heard of, estimates that a breeding pair of chickadees needs about six to 9,000 caterpillars for a single clutch of young. So native trees that can su 
native trees can support many more times the diversity and abundance of caterpillars that can provide that food source for birds and their young. So native plants uh, and making the right selections for your area can really be supportive of a, of a great diversity of other wildlife. Choosing the right plants based on your goals and your local site conditions can meet multiple goals. Choosing drought tolerant and locally adaptive native plants can reduce water and fertilizer use. You might even be able to get some harvestable products uh, out of the plants you choose if that's your goal. So fruits and medicinal plants can often be wonderful pollinator plants as well. One of the key things I want all of us to be thinking about is how we can get that season long bloom. So in early spring, plants like willows, maples, surface berries, red buds, spring ephemerals. I throw dandelions in there, but dandelions really often are only supporting honeybees. But having lots of things in bloom means that if we did have one of those early season events where plants that are blooming one day get wiped out, there are other things that are about to bloom that can come right in and fill that gap. In summer, uh, Monarda or bee balm is a wonderful plant for nectar for a lot of different bee species. A lot of butterflies will also visit it and even hummingbirds. Coneflower, milkweeds, sunflower, all of these resources. There are lots of resources on our website as well as on the Audubon website and I will give you links later for finding plant lists that are relevant for your area. For the fall, you can get a lot of beautiful colors goldenrods and asters are some heavy hitters in the early fall. Um, sneezeweed, not as bad as it sounds, sunflowers, anise hyssop, there's lots of different options depending on where you are. One thing to think about is have a few larval host plants in there, um, including, you know, the ones that we often, that often come to mind are the native milkweeds, which support our monarch butterflies. Monarch caterpillars are obligate, meaning they, they have to forage on this plant. Um, and we've seen a terrific decline in monarch butterflies. Terrific's not a great word there, but nearly an 80% decline in monarch butterflies over the last 20 years. So the more milkweed we can get out in the landscape for them, the better. It's also a high quality nectar source for pollinators and other beneficial insects like parasitic wasps, lady beetles, pirate bugs, etc. If you're looking for other host plant information, the Ladybird Johnson Wildflower Center in Texas has a wonderful website with lots of host plant information for different butterfly species, including some that are relevant for our, our local range. So one of the questions I often get is, um, what about ornamental plants? And what about the plants I find at my local Home Depot? So a lot of these ornamental varieties look very pretty, but can in many cases not have as much habitat value so especially the plants where the, the selection process has led to replacing those anthers, the pollen source on the plant, or um, with additional petals. So double petaled plants have um, additional petals in place of what would have been anthers or their pollen source, and their nectar can sometimes be inaccessible. So I would stay away from those. Um, we know, I think, less about native ours. I think there's still, um, there's still value in native ours, which are sort of native cultivars. But I would find your, your local native plant nursery um, and talk to them about what plants they see bees and other pollinators coming to. And again, critically, make sure plants aren't pre-treated with insecticides, especially the systemic insecticides that end up in nectar and pollen. One resource I did want to point out on plant selection is Plants for Birds, which is the Audubon Native Plant Database, which offers a list of local native plants relevant to your zip code um, and retailers that um, are in your area. So if you haven't been there, check it out. It's a great resource. All right, so what can we do? Our goal is to help urban areas realize their potential for successful pollinator conservation. So only about three to 5% of the American landscape is undisturbed habitat for plants and animals. So we need to be thinking about how we can modify the places where we live, work and play um, so that we don't lose biodiversity over time. If we're able to create long-term habitat in these spaces, we can uh, allow wildlife to thrive around us. 
The good news is many small spaces can make great habitat. Unlike many conservation issues that feel sort of out of our reach, pollinators are a group of animals that we can really help in our own yards and gardens. Green spaces in urban and suburban areas can be really important for wild pollinators and many species can be sustained in just very small patches of forage. So where do we start? Let's take a look at lawns. There are over 40 million acres of lawn in the United States. Turf grass is, interestingly, the single largest ir irrigated crop in the country. And these, these um, sort of monoculture lawns support a far fewer pollinators, beneficial insects, and songbirds than yards that are filled with flowering native plants. Ongoing research in urban spaces is telling us what all of us with gardens already know urban gardens, whether it's rain gardens or little pocket meadows, provide floral uh, flowering and nesting resources that provide for the reproduction and survival of bees and other wildlife. The presence of flowers is consistently correlated with pollinator health. And it's not just open meadow settings that can provide great habitat for bees and other pollinators. Nectar is a critical part of, um, of some birds' diets. So this is a woodland understory planting that includes columbine, which is the photo that you see here. On the right is a ruby-throated hummingbird foraging on uh, columbine. And you can see where just underneath, um, it's, uh, just underneath its beak, it's been hit with that pollen and it's gonna be transporting that from columbine to columbine. So nectar is a critical part of some birds' diets, although I don't know of any species that consumes nectar totally exclusively. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, to my understanding, most birds have a mixed diet that includes insects as a protein source. Some birds don't really consume nectar at all. They don't have the enzyme that breaks down sucrose in nectar, but hummingbirds, sunbirds, orioles, warblers, chickadees, many other birds will sip nectar which is kind of like an energy drink for flight. So beyond flowers, what we wanna be thinking about is nesting sites. This is one of the other components of habitat. So nesting sites for bees and wasps can include some areas of bare ground. So unmulched, unplanted that bees can burrow into. So that 70% of bees that lives below ground has an, an opportunity to access that. And then having some mess means you're actually doing the right thing. Having some bunch grasses as uh, overwintering sites for a variety of different insects. For the above ground nesting bees, having some plants, this is, comes back to plant selection, but having some plants that have that pithy or hollow stem. Some examples would be cane berries, uh, sumacs, joe pie weed, cone flowers, hyssop, roses, um, you can see in this picture on the bottom right um, that that pith, there's little hollow bits uh, in those stems that bees might be able to burrow right into. In terms of management, I get a lot of questions about timing and what I have decided to do in my own yard is leave flower stalks intact over the winter and then when temperatures, air temperatures are in their sort of upper 50s, 60, prune them back to create nest sites, openings for uh, bees to burrow in in the early spring. And you can cut those at a variety of heights. Um, they need about six inches max uh, or minimum to be able to burrow in and actually form a tunnel. So you can cut at a variety of different heights if you're, if you're wanting to create that nesting space. And then just observe, see if anything comes in. I had a ton of serotina, the small, uh, small carpenter bees living in my Menarda last year. One of the other key concepts we talk about with yard management is leave the leaves. So all of these leaves, um, this leaf litter is actually an important overwintering space for beetles, butterflies, moths, and other beneficial insects. So you can leave that, um, you know, a thin layer on the grass, or you can sort of rake leaves from the grass into your sort of planted areas as mulch, and that will allow those beneficial insects to make it through the winter. Um, I would avoid sort of flailing or shredding leaves as that destroys that leaf litter habitat for these beneficial insects. So a couple inches of leaves on your turf is probably going to smother whatever remaining turf you have there left, but um, a thin layer actually can benefit lawns, um, providing just that right amount of organic matter and nutrients to help lawns grow.
So finally, coming back to birds. So trees, plants, brush piles in your garden can offer shelter to birds and the many, many beneficial insects that nest in those stems and in the soil. And again, a little mess means you're doing it right. Shrubs and trees that maintain their leaves during the winter can provide cover for birds from wind and rain and snow. And those fruiting plants can provide food into the winter months. One thing to think about would be having some different canopy levels for diverse shelter needs. So always be thinking about diversity, diversity of bloom times, diversity of sort of vegetative structure. All of these things create more habitat spaces and niches for different types of wildlife. Summing up the key takeaways for all of our different bees and birds. As I said at the beginning, many invertebrates play key roles in our environments, including nutrient cycling, as well as serving as prey for other species. Without healthy populations of invertebrates, birds, fish, amphibians, and other creatures lose a key source of food. So like I said earlier, a pair of chickadees have to gather that 10,000 caterpillars to successfully raise their chicks. So the more that we can do to build habitat that supports that base of the food chain, the more we're doing for rippling up into other parts of the ecosystem. By taking steps to support pollinators, the base of the food chain and the base of our ecosystems, we support all of those levels of plant communities and wildlife that depend on pollinators. That pollinator habitat has ripple effects that improves the functioning of our landscapes for birds, beneficial insects and other wildlife. That's the main thing I want you to walk away from this with. So if you need more ideas, um, the one thing I really would, would recommend at all levels, and I think many birders are already doing this, but just be observant, stay curious, observe what's happening in your communities. If you see a plant that's just covered with pollinators, find out what it is, maybe put it in your yard. Um, visit our resource library at Xerces.org, visit the Plants for Bird database at Audubon, explore uh, community science projects and other opportunities to get involved with monitoring. We have programs like Bumblebee Watch where you can basically just take a photo of a bumblebee that you found on a plant, submit it, and it helps us keep records on where bumblebees are flourishing, flourishing and sometimes has been able to, to find some rare bumblebee species out in the wild. And then, you know, our last, my last pitch would just be to support our work and become a Xerces member if you're interested. And again, uh, that's visiting our website at xerces.org. With that, I will take questions. Thanks so much for being here with me. Thanks, Emily. And I just want to remind everyone that at this point, you can ask questions about birds, about bees, about pollinators, about native plants. We have Emily here to answer them. And we also have a couple of our own Audubon scientists on hand in the chat and, uh, and on the webinar as well. Uh, this webinar will again be recorded. It is being recorded and it will be made available afterwards on our YouTube, on Facebook, and on our Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York websites. Um, so Emily, to kick us off, we had a question from Felix, age five. And Felix would like to know, is all grass bad for the environment uh, because he likes to play soccer outside on grass. And um, so he is wondering, is all grass bad for the environment? Hi Felix, thanks for your question. Definitely not, all grass is not bad for the environment. Um, I, think it's, I think it's absolutely great to have um, some turf grass available for things like soccer and other activities that we like to do on grass. Um, for that matter, there's lots of grasses that actually support, uh, that are larval host plants for skippers and other butterflies and moths. Uh, and native bunch grasses are super important for nesting habitat for those cavity nesting bees like bumblebees. Um, so in a word, no, there's lots of grasses that provide a lot of great benefits um, for our environment. Thanks, Emily. And another question uh, came up from someone who is an apartment dweller. Obviously, we're talking a lot about planting native plants in your yard. And uh, maybe you could speak a bit to those uh, folks who just want to add a couple native plants in containers on their fire escape, um, 
how can how can everyone get involved? Good question. And yeah, this really was um, thinking a lot more about sort of yards and garden space, but that's a great question because not everyone has access to yard and garden space. Um, if you do have a balcony or a fire escape, um, there are plants that do really well in containers and there are bees in our cities that would love you to put some plants out on those balconies. Um, some of the plants, well, I'd have to actually think about, you know, depending on where you are, what plants to recommend. Um, but even things like kitchen herbs, can be great um, both for you know providing you with some herbs for your kitchen and also uh, a great nectar source for bees. In terms of what else you can do, you know you can even if you're living in New York City and you're going out into the park in Central Park, you can take part in a lot of our sort of community science efforts um, that are documenting what bees are visiting flowers in those parks. Um, so that's one way to contribute to pollinator conservation efforts, um, and then just supporting, supporting the farmers with the, um, you know, the best pollinator management practices um, by putting your wallet to the, to the use in stores um, and supporting local plant nurseries when you do go out and put balcony plants on your balconies. Um, I don't know if that's a perfect answer, but there's still lots of things we can do even if we don't have yard space to put plants into. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Um, we are getting a number of questions about leaving the leaves. Um, so when people leave uh, leaves as mulch on their garden beds, uh, in nooks and crannies around their yards, um, when, if any, is a good time to remove the leaves? That's a great question. I sort of, in my own space, um, you know, some of those leaves will end up just breaking down and forming mulch. Um, so some of them probably don't need to be removed at all. Um, but I've been doing it sort of when air temperatures and soil temperatures get to uh, 60 degrees or above. And one way that you can do it if you're not flailing, um, flailing the leaves and shredding them up would be just to create a leaf pile, you know, somewhere in the back of your, your yard or garden um, and then pile them all back there and sort of let them compost because that will still allow for a lot of in insects to emerge out of that leaf litter. If you're putting them in bags, I would say do it after uh, air temperatures are above 60 degrees. Great, thank you. And would you be able to speak to um, quote unquote deer resistant plants or? Um, I don't have great, uh, a great list of that at the moment. Sorry, not off the top of my head. <laughs> I know that we we do get a lot of questions about deer um, because of of the brows, um, but uh, maybe maybe instead we can sort of reverse that question because we're also getting a number of questions, which is what are uh, the like top three, say top five native plants that someone can put in their yard who who has nothing to start off with or may only have invasive species. And um, it, it, so the top three to five to attract birds and, and pollinators. To attract birds and pollinators. Some of my favorites um, would be mountain mint. Mountain mint is an amazing plant for pollinators and um, things like parasitic wasps. Um, so that's one of my top five. I think um, blazing star might be up there as well, both for, um, it, it, it provides a little bit of a perch for birds that come in, as does echinacea, so purple coneflower. Um, Monarda is, would definitely be on the top of the list for bees um, and butterflies. And then for a fall plant, I think an aster would probably, should make it on there. New England aster is a wonderful plant. Um, Joe pie weed is a wonderful plant. All of those will support um, a, a pretty good diversity of pollinators. Great, thank you. And um, Emily, what is the uh, what is the photo behind the pine, well, not the photo behind the pine gross beak <laughs> that is currently on screen, but what is the plant in the photo? I believe it's a cherry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the I don't have the species information on it. Thank you. Um, and uh, so for um, 
for people who may be dealing with invasives, uh, do you have any particular issues about, um, about getting rid of them or sorry, not issues, advice about getting rid of them or, uh, or what to plant in place after you do remove them? Yeah, so it depends on your situation. Great question. Um, you know, there are going to be some invasive plants that are just really challenging to control. So some of it comes down to, um, you know, how competitive is it? Is it um, making it really difficult for any native plants to persist in your yard or garden? Because um, that might determine sort of how heavily you go in for controlling it. Um, Otherwise, you can sort of take a, you know, what I, what I do, I have, I have invasive plants. I've had garlic mustard. I've had um, celandine. I've had um, a variety of things come in to my yard from my neighbors. And for me, it's just a matter of sort of mechan mechanical removal, hand weeding, and then replacing it with a native plant, transplant of some kind, um, preferably one that's kind of competitive. There are some species that do better at sort of out-competing invasive species than others. So, um, but it does come down to sort of what your local conditions and what the actual problem plants are for you. Um, but there's, if you have questions about specific plants, you can always reach out to me. My email is here, emily.may at Xerces.org. I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Emily. Um, we are getting a number of questions about attracting specific birds to one's backyard. And so I wonder if now I could, I could also invite our Audubon experts to participate if, uh, if you have something uh, here that you'd like to share. But um, in particular, people are interested in, of course, attracting hummingbirds to their yard. Um, but bluebirds are another popular one. Um, so any advice on either of these species, what to plant, how to build a, an environment that these birds really love? I can answer on the hummingbirds and then I would love to turn it over. Um, but cardinal flower, monarda, salvia, so sage plants, um, and columbine are some of, uh, some of the best plants for attracting hummingbirds to your yards. Bluebirds, I'm not so sure about, so I'll turn that over. Hi there, this is Ken Elkins, Community Conservation Manager for Audubon, Connecticut. As far as bluebirds are concerned, it's not a specific plant, but instead it's what the habitat looks like. They need an area, usually close to an acre, that has uh, tall grasses and uh, herbaceous plants that they're going to be hunting for insects in those areas. Uh, so it's having lots of host plants around is what would be able to attract the bluebirds to your yard. Thanks, Ken. And Ken, could you please speak just a little bit more about, um, about how to just sort of more holistically attract uh, different bird species to your yard? Like you're saying, the bluebirds are like specialized habitat or, you know, what's the situation for other birds? Uh, hummingbirds might be the one group of birds where we can say a specific plant might attract them the most. Uh, instead, the idea of host plants is great because as uh, Emily said, all of our songbirds will use insect material to feed their young. So if you want to have successful nests this spring in your yard, we need more host plants. And that comes from anything from the oak trees and letting those grow in your yard to the variety of these uh, pollinator supporting plants as well, all have a different variety. We had some comments in the chat asking about herbs or vegetables. And yes, some of our uh, herbs are also great at being a host plant for some of our favorite butterflies, like black swallowtail is going to feed on most of the herbs in your garden as well. So they're uh, a great source to have around. Uh, people can also visit our Plants for Birds websites that you can uh, find those on either of our state Audubon websites or audubon.org slash plants for birds. Put in your zip code. So even if you're not from Connecticut or New York, you can get to that uh, database and there you can actually choose 
uh, by type of bird species or whether you're looking for deer resistant plants, which is a question in the chat box quite a bit this afternoon too. Uh, and we're gonna have more webinars later this spring on uh, choosing those plants and how to use that database. Thanks, Ken. And yeah, I'd also like to point out that I believe the database um, has lists of native plant nurseries uh, near your zip code as well, although um, we invite you to uh, suggest your favorite nurseries in the chat and uh, we can share them with everyone who is uh, who's still on and, um, and, and sort of compile a list. That would be great. Um, so Emily, back to you, when planting pollinators, whether annuals or perennials, and maybe there's a different answer for, for each, um, should people be grouping them together or spreading them out across their property? Great question. So uh, pollinators do, as they fly over a patch, zoom in on patches that are larger. So what I often will recommend for when you're planting transplants of of our native perennials, put them in groupings of maybe three plants to five plants um, and, and clumping them that way across your yard or backyard. Um, that can help pollinators sort of zoom in and then efficiently collect pollen from that patch that they're, that they're visiting. For annuals, I think um, that's less true. It sort of depends on how you're planting them. Um, you know, if you're if you're putting in sort of an annual wildflower mix, it's gonna come up uh, as a diversity of species and sort of jumbled about, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but for those perennial plants that are gonna be around for a long time and you're able to sort of think about their spacing, um, clumping in three to five is, is a good strategy for drawing in pollinators. Thanks, Emily. And is there a way for folks to know whether the plants they're buying have been treated with chemicals? Is this a question that we should be asking before we purchase plants? Great question. So we are developing resources around this because it's a question that comes up all the time. Um, and the answer is it's, it's a hard thing to know, um, especially because the person that you ask in a nursery might not be involved in the production of those plants um, and might not have any idea. So some of the systemic insecticides, the neonics, have been phased out of some of the large box stores and some were never in use by some you know, local plant nurseries. But there are other systemic insecticides that have come on the market or that are in use now as replacements that still pose risks. So it's a question that's worth asking, sort of how do you produce these plants? Are they, are they treated with insecticides? You know, if it turns out that when you ask that question of a nursery, the answer is yes. Um, there are some uh, things you can do to, to help protect pollinators from exposure to those plants. You know, if you really have no other source for a plant, um, you know, for that first year, you could, you could pluck flowers um, off of a transplant that's come in that's been contaminated in some way, um, just to prevent pollinators from picking up pollen and nectar from it. Um, but we are developing resources and we should have them out by pollinator week, which is in uh, mid June around sort of how do you ask your nursery these types of questions. What questions do you should you even be asking um, and and where do you go from there. Great, Emily, that leads me perfectly into uh, my next question, which is based off of a, a series of questions we're getting in the chat about um, Suggestions for what to say to neighbors or a townhome community who want the more traditional manicured lawns, um, who may be working with landscapers who use pesticides. Um, how do we encourage others to try uh, native plants, to try leaving leaves? Um, what, are your, what are some of your favorite talking points or, or methods to uh, to convince others that this is a great opportunity? Yeah, so that's a, that's a tough question and it, it does require some, um, uh, I guess, empathy for where other people are coming from. So what I, what I think often is the case is just maybe a lack of imagination. And so what you can do is, um, you know, provide an example of what a lawn can look like or what a yard can look like that, um, 
incorporates native plants but still remains attractive you know you can you can have it both ways you can have a, a, a yard that looks attractive and is filled with native plantings and sometimes it's just a matter of sort of showing the way um, but those those conversations can be tough um, one thing that i have have heard proposed as a strategy for neighborhoods that um, you know, where there's maybe home and homeowners association restrictions about what you can do in your front yards, other than sort of going to the community and trying to change those is what's called mullet gardening, which is business in the front party in the back. So having some chaos in the back and having all of your native plants um, and wildlife habitat back there, but keeping things relatively orderly in the front. Um, so it, sometimes it's just a matter of, of leading the way and showing what native plants can look like and that they're attractive options that look tidy um, that people can use in their front yards and, and you don't have to just fall back on the on the lawn trope. Thanks so much. That's fantastic. I think we have time for one or two more questions and I will add that many people in the chat, thanks to everyone, are pointing out that the tree in the photo is a crab apple. So Emily, you can awesome. confirm, you can confirm okay. that for us later. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, I grab. So any advice uh, for people who have a lot of shade, whose backyards or or gardens are very shaded? There are some understory plants that flower in the springtime, um, things like foam flower and wild columbine. Um, so you can try some of them. They're a bit delicate. Um, and they don't always love every situation, especially really deep shade. Um, but another option might be hostas, which mainly support some of our larger bees when they do flower, um, like carpenter bees. But, um, you know, in those cases, sometimes it's thinking about other wildlife that might be using them and providing that sort of structured layers of vegetation. So having some understory shrubs um, or other vegetation that can provide some some shelter for for wildlife that's using those those woods. Thanks, Emily. And uh, we had a lot of great responses to uh, to the question of where are you getting your native plants locally. I'm seeing the Catskill Native Nursery, uh, Native Plant Trust Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts, Earth Tones. Native Plant Nursery in Woodbury, Connecticut. Uh, Cat oh, Catskill Native Plant Nursery in Kirkonkson, New York. Um, so thanks to everyone who have shared. It seems like Catskill Native Nursery is a pretty popular one. I know that the DEC in New York is having its uh, spring plant sale still, and we've been directing a lot of folks to that. Um, and uh, Emily, one uh, let's let's we'll wrap it up with one last question, um, which is um, that it seems like many many towns are are interested in building pollinator pathways or or gardens on a larger scale. Um, so can you talk a bit about how if we're all working together? what the impact can be to create these these pathways up and down the flyway? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Connecticut and New York Pollinator Pathways um, has been one of the most amazing projects that I've been able to witness, which is towns coming together to work on pollinator habitat. Um, you know, started in one town, has moved to, I don't even know how many now, like over 85 towns at my last count. I'm sure it's more than that now. And really what this means is you can take small backyard habitat, your, your one small patch of ground that you have cultivated some pollinator plants in and connect it in with you know, acres, what, what ends up being acres and acres of pollinator habitat across the landscape. And this allows bees to be able to move from patch to patch, um, our migratory species like monarchs to sort of have corridors that they're able to move across the landscape. Um, it, it provides connectivity and, and sort of linkages between these different communities. So the more that we can convince our neighboring communities to join in on these types of efforts, the better. Um, you know, some of the amazing efforts that we've seen are along rail trails and canal paths and, and things that are sort of naturally linear features that end up um, when they have pollinator plants alongside them, 
moving pollinators through the landscape more easily. Um, so these are, this is a really incredible effort. Um, and if you haven't seen, you know, these, this effort before, you can take a look. I believe it's pollinator-pathways. Um, and I can't remember if it's .net or .com. Well, thanks, Emily. Uh, I think a nice way to wrap up, um, and of course, I'll let you close us out, but uh, is with a comment from John in the chat who says, these recommendations really do work in five years at a suburban house in upstate New York on about one third of an acre. Uh, he removed about half of his mowed lawn, replaced with about a dozen different native shrubs and most of the flowers you mentioned. And he, his backyard bird list increased from, uh, increased in five years to about 51 different species. So that, that is truly incredible and really shows the impact of, of what native plants can do. Um, so Emily, any, any last words for folks? Obviously we mentioned people can visit Plants for Birds on any of the Audubon websites, um, visit our database, put in your zip code, you'll get a list of the best plants for your area and the birds that, um, that are attracted to these plants. Um, as well as some local places to find them near you. Emily, any last uh, things you'd like to leave folks with today? All I, I guess I would say is that Habitat can really start with a single plant. And um, I'm really glad that you were able to join us today to talk about pollinators, my favorite thing to talk about. Thanks so much for having me here. Thanks to everyone who's joined us. And thanks to Emily and our experts at Audubon, Connecticut and Audubon, New York. Have a good day, everyone.